Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tips, scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so honored to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, child and teen development specialist, author, and speaker, and most importantly, parent of two great kids who give me the opportunity to love, learn, and grow every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy. But we're in this together, and we have some great people helping us along the way. Now let's face it, when people hear the word toddler, it often conjures up thoughts of the terrible twos, torrential tantrums and tirades that feature the word NO in big capital letters. There are frustrations about toddlers not listening, not eating fruits and vegetables, not sleeping, not listening, not allowing parents to go out on a date or to go to the bathroom without their company. But what if I told you that by looking at life through a toddler's eyes and using the methods developed by Dr. Montessori, you can learn the peaceful way of raising a toddler to become a curious, responsible, kind individual. This is exactly what we're going to do today with our next guest. Simone Davies is the author of The Montessori Toddler, runs parent-child Montessori classes in Amsterdam at her school, Jacaranda Tree Montessori, and is mother of two young adults. She also has a popular blog, The Montessori Notebook. Finding Montessori helped her so much when raising her own children, and it's now her passion to help other parents introduce these ideas in their own homes as well. She was looking to find a way to be with her kids that wasn't about bossing them about, threatening them and bribing them, or giving them free reign either. And she wanted them to have a positive experience of school, not just to pass tests, but to love learning. Well, we are so excited to talk to you. So welcome, Simone, to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Thank you so much for having me. What a delight and an honor to be here. I'm thrilled to have you. I know you've been listening for the, to the podcast for a long time, and I am so excited to have you on. But before we get into the thick of things, for those who haven't yet read your book or learned about the philosophies and methods of Dr. Montessori, what gets you up in the morning and what got you so interested in raising toddlers the Montessori way? Yes, it, well, I found Montessori when I had these two young children and I was kind of thinking, I don't want to put them into timeout. I don't want to bribe them to get their cooperation, like you were saying in the introduction. And I didn't really know how to do it otherwise, because around me, I'd been to a traditional school myself and been raised in a very traditional way, like threatened with a wooden spoon. My parents had never hit me, but you know, it was really old fashioned the way that I was disciplined. And I just felt like every time I learned something at school, it was just to pass tests. I put up my hand in the classroom and said, is this in the test? And if it wasn't in the test, I didn't learn. I didn't like listen. I would just pass notes with friends and things. And you know, you get uh, kind of idealistic when you have your own children that you want something else for your children. So I visited Montessori school and just loved how it looked. It looked so inviting. I loved how the teachers were so approachable, not only to me, but they were so kind to the children as well. And that the children were all self-motivated. There was no one telling the children what to do in this classroom, but they were there busy, very, very industrious and learning in all different areas of a very rich you know, curriculum classroom. So I'm like, oh, this looks like a much more interesting way to learn. Um, and then before I knew it, that like um, led me to my own you know, studies and wanting to work with families because it had had such an impact on me that I wanted to share what I'd learned um, with other families. And that led to me working in a monster classroom and now starting my own school when I moved to Amsterdam and then writing a book where I get to share that. I feel like there's secrets of Montessori and I wanted like parents to know about them too. Like how do Montessori teachers get the children to listen to them in a mm. kind way without threatening them? So I'm like, oh, I'm just going to tell you guys what we do and see if that's helpful for you as well. Oh, I am sure it's going to be extremely helpful. And I'm so excited to launch into this because I think that our listeners are going to be just excited to hear what these secrets are. So you heard in my intro, and, and you talk about it in your book, of course, that when many people hear the word toddler, they think 
the terrible twos. So how do you view toddlers differently than this label, the terrible twos? Yeah, it all started when my son was a toddler and I saw things through his eyes and had enormous empathy for him. Like, oh, he's not actually just being terrible. He's just having a hard time in the world. You know, nothing's built for his size, so he can't do things for himself. And if I make things smaller, he can be successful. Mm -hmm. And I can just see how capable they are. I also loved how, like, easily they pick things up so when I work with young toddlers if you show them something once they're able to do it again and again and if you've ever been into someone's house they know exactly where the toys are right Mm so it's like they've got a great memory it just might be that their prefrontal cortex is still developing so when um, they aren't listening to you it's not really that they're not listening to you it's just that their will is different to you know what society wants them to do right Mm -hmm. now so I really just see things from their perspective try and make things as easy as possible for them and also just provide empathy when things don't go their way and I don't necessarily rush in to you know give them everything they want but support them through so in a Montessori approach we're more like the child's guide than their boss or their servant Mm, wow that's really just a great way of saying that so So just to push that further then, if we were to replace the terrible twos and the sort of times of tantrums and the age of the constant no with what we really need to know about toddlers regarding what they need to be able to do to learn or interact with or understand the world and also what they are not trying to do, as you were just mentioning, like they're they're really not trying to give you a hard time um, and make the world more complicated and difficult for themselves or for you. What are like three or, you know, three or four things that we really do need to know about toddlers? Well, I think the most frustrating thing for us is that they actually need to learn to say no. They're going through this, what we call a crisis of independence, where they're like, they want to be your baby, but also they want to do their own thing. They're basically making that transition like a teenager does, you know, moving away from their family. And they're doing that, you know, on a very small scale. So when they start saying no, they're starting to say, oh, I'm, I'm in my own person and I can react. And so as a parent, instead of taking it personally, we're like, oh, you really want to run on the road and I'm going to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can acknowledge that. Or sometimes we actually don't need to say no, like to something. Oh, you really want to see what I'm doing in the kitchen? Well, actually, yeah, I don't have to turn the TV on. I'm going to make it possible for you to help me here. Mm -hmm. So they need to say, no, I don't like what's going on here. Um, But and then that's our job then to decide, is it something that we can give them the freedom to do? Or is it a case where I need to keep them safe and I'm going to set a clear limit here in, in a kind way? Um, so that's definitely one thing they need to say no. They also need to move. And I think that we get really frustrated because kids want to get out of their high chair mm-hmm. or kids want to run away in a park. And when you just say, it's not actually a kid, um, you know, being um, like being a runaway child. They just see a, a big space and they need to move. So they want to run and explore it. So how am I going to do that in a safe way? And then it might just be like, oh, my kid really is that kind of kid who runs a lot. So I'm going to always make sure that I go to a playground where there's a safe boundary so I can feel relaxed and my child can explore. Or if we're... At home and they need to move and I'm complaining that they're always you know trying to climb on the kitchen table mm-hmm. how am I going to set up an amazing obstacle course so that they can move in a way you know instead of saying how can I stop them moving it's like no how can I find them a way to move in a way that's going to be okay for me and for them mm-hmm. and then like another thing I guess I would say is that they need limits you they need to know sometimes that things aren't always going to go their way and I think sometimes we're scared of setting limits with children these days um, because um, we're trying to be these laissez-faire parents, but actually they need not too many, otherwise they'll feel like they live in a dictatorship, but they need some kind of clear limits as well and, and set them in a positive way. And I think that that's something that I was missing. Like I don't have any role models of people who can do that. Um, but I love like being able to just say to a toddler, oh, you know, I thought I was okay with you playing with my wallet. And actually I can see that I'm worried now that I'm going to lose my credit card. So I'm going to put this away and I'm going to find something else that you can open and close, you know? So it's how you can kind of often set a limit with love. Oh, it's so great. I, one of the things that I just latched on to that you were just mentioning is that you do a lot of like in your book and, and just what you did right now is just like, you're not actually trying to do this. Here's what they're trying to do. I'd like love that. And you even say this in your book that you're, you're like a translator. You try to translate what they're doing um, into, into a way that, that we understand it as adults. And I would love to just play a little game with you of what's actually happening, since I I love that in your book. And so if you could (laughs) translate these for us so that our listeners can understand what's actually going on. Um, Mm -hmm. So what looks like a battle of wills is actually... 
Oh, yeah. It's like the toddler is saying to us, oh, um, I really want to do that. And us as the parents saying, oh, I can't let things always go your way. So mm -hmm. that's where the battle comes in. And actually, exactly what we were talking about before is how can then I make a, find a way that we can both have our needs met in that moment. Mm, OK, what looks like repeating the same story over and over again is actually... Oh, yeah, that's just a total of practicing and mastering a skill. So storytelling or practicing a game over and over again. And to us, we're like, we've done that puzzle. We're over it. And to them, they need to practice and practice until they master it. Yes, because mastery is really important to a toddler, which you mentioned in your book. And I love that. I love that you're talking about this this incident that happens so often in our lives. We're like, oh, my gosh, if I hear this knock knock joke one more time. But I, I really it's so interesting to hear it through through your perspective so that we understand it from from their point of view. So uh, what seems like our child intentionally trying to be as slow as possible and slow us up is actually... Oh, that's just them living in the present moment and they explore everything along their way. And so you've ever walked down the street with a toddler and they spot like a weed growing up. And you, <laughs> actually, when you look at that in a beautiful way, you're like, you're right. I walk past that weed every single day. I have no idea how that managed to grow here, you know. Um, so I love that they can bring us back to the present moment. But if we look at it the wrong way, it can wind us up like, come on, we just need to get to the shops. Right. And sometimes we do. And sometimes we can actually just say, yeah, why don't we just go for a walk to go to the end of the block and back? So. Okay, excellent. I'll give you one more. Um, these are fun. What seems like an explosive tantrum from a toddler is actually... Yeah, so usually the explosive tantrums, they save their parents. And I always say, like, actually, it's an honor to have a toddler have a tantrum on you because that's them feeling so safe that they want to release everything that they've been holding on to all day. Um, and yeah, so it looks like an explosive tantrum, but actually be honored that they feel safe enough to let it go with you. Oh, well, I can say that I've been honored more than once then. <laughs> Many times. And in the most embarrassing places. Right? <laughs> Yes. It doesn't just uh, stay with the toddlerhood. It can go on uh, throughout childhood at times, I think. Okay. So one of the areas that is a critical part of Montessori's methods is, I love this, designing a thoughtful environment. Your book is so beautiful. It really echoes this idea of having a thoughtful environment with that's that's created with a child, uh, a toddler in mind. Can you give us some key idea, ideas of what a Montessori environment takes into account and perhaps even some things that our listeners can think about for how they may design their own spaces at home that might help with learning or inspiration or positive development of their children? Yes, absolutely. I mean, basically, I think there's one phrase that sums up most of it, which is a place for everything and everything in its place. And so children actually under six have quite a strong sense of order. They know where things belong. And so if you always say put your coats on hooks by the front door, then they'll know that my coat always goes there, which also is an advantage because when you're leaving the house, then they can always find their coat, their shoes and where everything goes in its special place. The problem is, is that mostly we have too much stuff and we don't have these fixed oh, places. Yes, so you are so then, right. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to strip that back and follow that approach like less is more I don't actually I actually quite like the work of Marie Kondo because she yes. actually gets rid of all the things you don't need and you only have available then things that are useful or that they're you know working to master and I'm not saying like get rid of all the toys but I'm definitely saying have less things out that are available to them and then store the rest and then rotate them so that you can kind of keep I'm interested and also just focus on what they need to play with right now. Um, and then we're also looking, like we said earlier, how can we set up the environment for the children to have success? Because actually young children like to be involved and like to do things for themselves. You know, they go through that me do it, me do it mm -hmm. kind of phase. So it might be as simple as like setting up their wardrobe so that they can choose from two t-shirts and two shorts, um, something that they could wear that's weather appropriate for that day rather than the whole cupboard and then they can't choose or they pull everything out and mm -hmm. make a big mess. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like just give them what's available or in the bathroom it's having a step stool so that they can reach up and help themselves to the toothbrush and trying to put the toothpaste on themselves um, or if the kids really like working with the shampoo but you're worried they're going to use up all the shampoo yes. have a little travel size bottle and just refill it each day with a little bit be about you know happy for them to squeeze out because they love squeezing and washing themselves then and so they'll be more involved in that or if they like to help in the kitchen I love those learning ladders that you can have now in your kitchen but I even just had a step ladder that was like a from a painting kind mm -hmm, of thing mm -hmm. the hardware store and they'd stand at the front top and help me make sandwiches or wash some vegetables while I was preparing dinner and they basically get became so capable that gradually I'd step back and my 
um, toddlers that became, you know, teenagers and they were preparing meals. I, they'd tell, choose what they wanted from a recipe book. We'd go to the shops and buy the things. And then I'd be like their sous chef just talking them through things they didn't know. Mm -hmm. And now they can be delightful. My son moved out of home last year and he says, oh, yeah, so I cooked corn fritters for the boys tonight. Mm -hmm. And I, when I went to visit their house, it was full of fruit and vegetables. And I was just like, like we've actually raised children who can look after themselves and are pleased with what they can contribute. Mm -hmm. I love all of this. And I, I think that while everything has been geared toward toddlers in your book, that this is this is a lesson that we can take in at any at any juncture that we can have our kids help us in the kitchen, that they can help us around the house, that they want to be involved. And that if you have kids that are eight, nine and ten and this hasn't been what you've been doing you t definitely don't have to think that you missed the boat. Like this is, this would be a fine time to say, you know what, I'm going to start involving them in the kitchen. And uh, my kids are still uh, pretty short and still using the step ladder, <laughs> step ladders, even at nine and 10, we have a very tiny family and uh, they love to help out in the kitchen uh, and, and make things, all kinds of things, pancakes, eggs, whatever. So I, I like to have them, you know, using the, the step ladder with me and and they like to bake and and all kinds of things as well so just for those who are listening who may not have done this yet and and the toddlers are now even teenagers this mm -hmm. is uh, this is a time to to get them involved and and we can absolutely use some of these great great ideas there's uh, never a time when we shouldn't be cleaning <laughs> having <laughs> a clean closet and you know having smaller amounts of things to choose from so i feel like right now i'm inspired to clean out my whole closet just listening to this so <laughs> i feel like it's great for any any age group I all right also like even making things accessible in the kitchen like young toddlers can set the table by if you have a low cupboard you know for them to have the bowls and the glasses and the plates and all of those kind of things yes. so um you know I still have my plates and bowls down low because I never know when little people are going to be visiting our house. And if you start from a young age, it's even easier because yes. they have just learned that thing. And my teenagers still take their laundry to our hamper because they know that the clothes will get washed if they go to there. So I've never had a battle with them. The most I've had to say is like, oh, I haven't seen your sports clothes and I need, you know, if you want them washed, I'm yes. putting some lo a load of washing on and then they run and get it because they want clean clothes. Yes, exactly. No, this is a very good point. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, I love that you say in your book that you sometimes have to act as the toddler's prefrontal cortex. I thought that was just so genius the way that you put that. And you say to allow all feelings, but not all behavior. So help us to understand what that looks like when our child is not listening or hurting another person or destroying property or or not going to sleep. How, how do we understand and allow for feelings, but still correct the behavior? Yeah. So going back to like being their prefrontal cortex, you know, people like Dan Siegel are brilliant for that because they've talked about flipping the lid. Yes. And when you flip your lid, you know, your prefrontal cortex isn't available to you. And pretty much a toddler lives with its like prefrontal cortex up. They're just acting from their, you know, animal part of their brain. Like, oh, I want to go straight ahead. And so I'm going to go straight ahead, but there may be a car or traffic, you know? So, um, Basically, when you recognize they're not trying to give you a hard time, but where they we actually just need to be their common sense for them. And I guess your listeners probably know now that the prefrontal cortex is developing until their early 20s. Mm -hmm. So we need to be that right through their childhood. And you'll need to do less of it as they get older and build their prefrontal cortex, but definitely in infancy um, with our toddlers. Um, then when we say we allow all feelings, we're like, okay, so when that lid is flipped um, and they're not accessing the prefrontal cortex, let them express all of those frustrations or their anger or their sadness that things didn't happen um, to help close that lid. And then once that lid's closed, then you can help them make amends if they threw all their toys on the floor or they hit someone like, oh, I've got a red mark on me. What should we do? Should we go and get a cold cloth or would you like to get me a tissue? And, you know, showing them how we make it up to somebody. Because I think that, you know, it's more like restorative justice as opposed to, you know, punishment. So punishment, I don't know if you've ever been punished, but basically you're mostly angry at the person that punished you rather than, you know, feeling like, oh, what did I learn from that moment? And now instead we can look at any moment as how 
about what can I teach my child from this or what can they learn in this difficult moment. So if they're not listening, I'm going to like allow them all their feelings, let them, you know, explode, whatever that is, but I'm not going to let them hit somebody or I'm not going to, um, yeah, so I'll step in like, oh, you guys are both hurting each other. I'm going to separate you and we're going to come back when everyone's feeling calm. And then in that calm place, you can make amends with each other or find solutions. That's how I would kind of, yeah. All right, so so this sort of brings me into thoughts about you had a, a an area in your book about ground rules and and putting them into action and you know I'm just thinking about that because we can't hit each other is obviously um, part of of a ground rule that most people would want in their household. So let's let's talk about ground rules and and putting them into action, uh, following through and dealing with them when they are broken. So. Mm-hmm. How do you set ground rules that help to limit set for these toddlers? And then what do we do when these ground rules are broken that in, in, in a reasonable age appropriate way, how do we cope with those? Yeah, that's exactly right. It has to be age appropriate. Um, so with the ground rules, like I said earlier, you don't want too many rules because otherwise then you just feel really restricted. But I love living in the Netherlands here where there's enough rules to keep us safe, but enough freedom for me to decide myself, you know, what's going on. That's why we love living here. Um, so it's a bit like that. So I have a rule like, like we sit at the table to eat because it's a practical thing. Not only will I then not have mice and things like that coming into my house trying to eat all the crumbs from the bedroom, but it's also a social occasion. And so they're learning that we have rules about being kind with each other and not hitting each other. And so it's my job to keep them, you know, safe as well. And so say that they get down from the table um, and they want to take food away, then I'll be like, I, then I would set a kind and clear limit. It's like, it looks like you want to get home the table and we keep our food at the table. So I'll put the food back here. And if you want to come and eat, then you can. And if you want to go play, then you can as well. So that would be an age appropriate limit for a toddler who I don't expect to sit at the table for the whole meal, you know, mm. till everyone's finished. Mm. But I keep the food at the table. And what's really funny is that in my classroom, if they're wanting to eat that cracker really badly, they will come back to the table. They mm-hmm. will come and sit back down. And if they're all done, they're done. And then I will start to model, okay, so it looks like you're all done. Now I'm going to take the plate to the kitchen. And then gradually over time, they learn to also help take the plate to the kitchen and then they just realize okay well we only eat when we're at the table so they learn that rule over time um if it's to if two siblings are hitting each other then like i said before there's almost like for me i love the how to talk so kids will listen and listen so kids will talk book my favorite maslitz yes and um i love that there's kind of like almost levels so like low level bickering is just them you know having to work out conflict you know so if they kind of just nagging each other a little bit i kind of might just make myself seen but then retreat and let them sort it out. And then it accelerates when, you know, like they're rough playing and their kids need to do rough play. They need to play fight and those kind of things. But sometimes that goes too far and then it gets into, you know, someone hurting themselves. So in our house, we came up with a rule that if they said someone said stop, then the play fighting stopped. But what that sometimes happened was is that some I could hear someone getting upset and I'd say, does someone need to say stop now? And then I'd hear, stop, stop, stop. And, you know, the play fighting would stop. So it's kind of like me kind of just being this outside source of reason, but Mm -hmm. then letting them sort it out themselves. And then sometimes it's like someone's really hurting the other. And then it's like, I see two kids who are really angry at each other. We're going to separate. And with like very young children, I would just be me sitting between the two of them, not saying them to their room or anything Mm -hmm. like this. But it's just kind of like, let's all get some quiet time and then we'll all regroup at the end. And then the bit I think that most people miss is this making amends with each other. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise you're basically just getting letting kids fight or letting kids get away with hurting someone or breaking something and not making it up but it would just be an age appropriate solution so for a young child it might be that they go and get a tissue or you know eventually they'll learn to say sorry but I don't force them to say sorry because I want it to be an authentic sorry not a sorry yes (laughs) those kind of things so I don't I I do show them how we can care for someone that someone's hurt and that we make it right by them oh yes that is very much a theme in my household (laughs) uh, this idea of what can we do to repair our relationship and now Mm -hmm. i just have to say that word repair and Mm -hmm. and and it's do you need ice are Mm -hmm. are you okay (laughs) at one point (laughs) when they were little i would be you know modeling the oh my goodness are you okay? Do you need ice? And then it would, they started to take, like repeat that verbatim. <laughs> it was so funny, <laughs> you know. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> you said it so many times. Yeah. 
oh my god like they would repeat that and i'm like okay well i mean I, you could say it in your own words right? <laughs> yeah but uh it is such an important thing to learn how to repair your relationship it's part of as you're saying making amends there's the 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 apologetic part of course that we would like but the action that one can take to help make the situation better is is just as if not more important so that you're showing that you uh, care about that person and you didn't mean harm so uh, i i absolutely agree with that and i appreciate that what you're saying so uh you talk about solving problems or i'm going to say it's co-solving problems with your toddler this might surprise some listeners as we know that toddlers are so young and some might not even be verbal yet so can you talk about how we can work on problem solving with toddlers and maybe even a couple of examples of doing so Mm -hmm. So I base a lot of this um, from Alfie Cohen's work, you know, where he says rather than doing something to kids, like work with them. And so even a young toddler, he's like or she is expressing some interest in wanting to do something and you want to be doing something different. It might be like that they want to stay at the park and you want to go home and cook. So you could just say like you really want to stay at the park and I really need to go home and cook. What are we going to do to solve the problem? And I might just wait in count to 10 in my head to see if anything comes up because sometimes they come up with like oh I'll just go on the slide one more time and then we'll I'll go and help you with the shops and you're like oh wow that was amazing and when they're toddlers mostly I might meet like you say co-solving problems I might be coming up with a few of the ideas and then they take it over but I even had the situation when my two kids were playing and Oliver couldn't have even been two years old because Emma was only crawling and she crawled over and took the was pulling at the truck that he was playing with And so I'm like, oh, I see two kids who, you know, want the same toy. How are you going to solve the problem? And I just counted to 10 in my head to give them time to process it. Not allowed like 10, 9, 8, because that just puts stress on kids, but just giving them time to process what I'd said. And all of a sudden, Oliver was taking off the front wheels of the truck and giving Emma the back wheels of the truck. And they both sat there super happy with like the two Mm -hmm. different parts of the vehicle. And I'm like, I would never have come up with that. I would have been rushing to find another toy or saying you need to chase chair and take turns and, you know, these kind of things. Because it's amazing how even young toddlers can come up with some super creative ideas that we hadn't even thought of. Oh, wow. I really love that. And the example is stellar. So helpful to understand. There's also another really funny story too. Like I remember that um, my kids were a bit older and my daughter was humming um, at breakfast and my son was like, Emma, can you stop humming? Have you been in this situation? Do you know what I mean? Of course. Of course. My son's like, please stop singing. Stop singing. (laughs) And I'm just thinking to myself, and I just want breakfast in peace. Like that's We've got three people all wanting different things. And I'm just, I'm just going to go to the fridge and get what I need right now. So I'm kind of counting to 10 in my head. And before I knew it, she, he, uh, my son had said, well, actually, it's not even that I'm irritated by the humming. It's just that song is just driving me crazy. And she's like, well, what about this one? And he went, yeah, okay, I don't mind about that. And like, so by the time I got back to the table, they'd worked it out themselves. Mm. Does that make sense? Like yes. if you build skills over time, they realize that we, yeah, we're not always having to interfere because I think the more we interfere to solve the kids' problems for them, the more the fighting seems to escalate. Mm. Yeah, it's great. Um, and we interviewed Alfie Cohn. And we, I mean, you had so many people in your book that I was like, oh, yes. Like, it was like <laughs> the lineup of how to talk to kids about anything. Jane mm-hmm. Nelson was in there. Yes. And we talked to the people who wrote how to talk so little kids can listen. Exactly, the, the children. The children, yes, it. yes. And it was so, so I think good. What I love about all of these authors is that it puts into practice Dr. Montessori's, you know, she wrote her books 100 years ago. And it's very beautiful how she says let's be the child's guide and says let's give them freedom within limits but in day to day we're like what does that look like and what I love about Jane Nelson's work and Alfie Cohen's work is like oh these are some tools and we'll support the Montessori approach so that's how come I've also used them in my book so much even though it's a book about Montessori yes no it's terrific it's the and all these people have so much to contribute to this Mm. conversation so why do you feel that parents should really be on board with incorporating these Montessori principles in their own homes. Yeah, so what I love about incorporating Montessori at home is that if your children go to Montessori school, they're getting, you know, lovely Montessori materials, this Montessori approach, you know, in their classroom for six hours a day. Some of us also don't have the privilege of getting to go to Montessori schools because they might be private schools in your area or they may not be a Montessori school in your area. But being able to apply these 
Montessori principles in our homes, things like, you know, setting up the home so the child can be successful, looking at the activities that they're really working to master rather than just having lots of junk lying around your house. And that parenting piece about being their guide rather than their boss and their servant means that the children get these principles 24-7 and you play such a big role as a child's parent, even they're only at school six hours a day. So the other days and also on the weekends, they're around you and getting your influence. So I just find that so important mm-hmm. that one, you'll be consistent with the school if they go to the Montessori school or they get to benefit from this approach even if they don't go to Montessori school. Mm-hmm. And I think as a, also the parents who I've had in my classes who get to practice these principles realize that it's a karma place to parent from because you're not taking everything personally you're like my child's having a hard time now how can I support them as opposed to my child doesn't respect me they don't appreciate anything I do and coming from a much more a battle of wills place yes right I think that's a long-term approach you're building you're building connection you're building trust so that your teenager will come to you when they need to talk to you about something that's really important to them right my my child's having a hard time not giving me a hard time yeah and just sort of changing the way that we're viewing things okay and it's not just this quick fix like okay if I put them into timeout they'll learn their lesson well it might work in a very short-term approach but then you're not building trust so that over time you're going to be the person that you can turn they that they will turn to when they're having a hard time as a teenager and things as well right we absolutely set the groundwork for that as at a very young age it's absolutely mm-hmm. true so you talk about the need to step back and observe your child before rushing in before jumping to conclusions, just observe without judgment. So why is observation so important to the Montessori approach? Yeah, I love this because Dr. Montessori was actually a doctor, a physician before she moved into education. So she didn't come with like a preconceived idea of what's going to work for these children. Instead, she like used this very objective way of observing children like, oh, they're doing this. So how can I support them right now? And basically, we do 250 hours of observation in our Montessori training to actually learn to strip back like all of the expectations so that we just really see the child for who they are. So as a parent, it could be like, oh, why won't my child listen to me? So actually, if I step back objectively and look at the situation it's be like oh I remember being a teenager and I wanted to do that too and they're just keeping fighting me but if I now recognize that in the objective place rather than taking it personally I can be much more helpful or it might be like why are they always fighting with their you know new sibling Um, I can maybe step back and see objectively oh yeah this is what happens leading up to that situation or why is my toddler biting and if you like look oh every time they get cornered by an older child they're the one that bites so you can see patterns and then you can actually use that information to react uh, to respond rather than being so reactive and then I the my favorite part about like an observation method is to actually see our children for who they are you know unique human beings as opposed to like oh a two-year-old should be able to do this like my two-year-olds really likes doing this kind of thing and so I can really support them in them expressing that and then if they need skills like they're not so good at this thing then I'm going to keep building them skills I can't make them into a more confident person but I can give them skills to be able to stand up for themselves um, Mm -hmm. and build skills where there you see some limitations so one of the areas that you talked about that obviously you know, really rang my bell, which is all on conversation, since that's such an area of interest for me, how we talk to kids. You have a very specific view, and Montessori does, about how we talk to kids, even as they are toddlers. And often we fall into patterns when we're talking to very young kids of using quote unquote baby talk or calling things different names that than they really are. Can you talk to us a little bit more about really what we want to strive for in conversations with our toddlers, even if they're not wholly verbal yet, um, and 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 yes, of course, when they are. Yeah, so I think like let's start with the baby talk. So even with a young child, we like simplify things like, oh, look at the woof woof, instead of look at the dog, mm-hmm. or. You know, actually, children are amazingly capable. And like I said earlier, they pick things up so easily. So Dr. Montessori recognized that actually we can give them very rich vocabulary from a very young age. So instead of just saying, oh, there's a dog, if you know it's a Labrador, you can say, oh, look at that beautiful Labrador. Um, Or if you know the names of the flowers, you can say, oh, look at this hydrangea. And 
you, then you just realize how limited you are. Like, I don't actually know all the names of these trees. I'm going to find out. Mm-hmm. And then they actually modeling for your child that when you don't know something, you can look it up and you can find out more about it. Um, so just like they can learn the name of a banana and apple, just keep giving the opportunities to, you know, if they're interested in vehicles, which a lot of young children are, then you can say, this is a front wheel loader and this is an excavator. And I was fascinated myself actually as a grown up to go, what is the difference between a bulldozer and an excavator? And you're like trying to work out and they pick it up so easily. Yes. So it's like instead of baby talking them, just give them rich language and then you'll just see it come out. And like um, a kid who's really interested in the dinosaur age, you know, I have never heard so many complicated names for dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. And it was until I had a child who was interested in dinosaurs, I'm like, a Parasaurolophus. I thought there was just a Tyrannosaurus Rex mm-hmm. and a Stegosaurus. <laughs> and so they're very capable of learning very difficult things. The yes. other thing that I think um, we're really specific about is the, um, and you, you've discussed it in your podcast before, is not always just saying good job to children, oh, yes. um, but rather focusing on the effort and giving them feedback as opposed to this empty praise. Like they're basically, you're just teaching a child to always look to an external person to see if they're doing a good job. And actually, what are they learning in this moment and why are you giving them the feedback? So it might be like, oh, I saw you put your shoes on and got your bag packed for preschool. Now that's what I call being independent. And then imagine all that rich language that you're they're mm-hmm. getting. If not else you know um but then they're also like learning yeah i did pack my own bag and that feels good to be resourceful and so they're actually you're building the intrinsic motivation so that they'll be able to not always look externally from themselves mm. to a Ag- job. agreed and it, it's it's uh, i really like hearing that rich language i once got I mean, I've probably more than once. I, I write a character education curriculum called Powerful Words, and uh, it's for you know, ages three and up. And it's used in, in after school programs worldwide, but also in some typical schools now. So some uh, parents had gotten back to me at one point, like very early on, and said, do you really think that our, our children are going to be able to say some of these words like perseverance and indomitable spirit and <laughs> whatever else? And I was like, you know, they could say Jennifer and Stephanie and they could say, you know, they, they, there's, they, they could say all kinds of things, you know, <laughs> peanut butter sandwich. They could say all these things so they, yeah. can, they can absolutely say these words. And I think we, you're right. We sell them short and we think they can't say these things and maybe it's not perfect. Perfect, and maybe there's some speech, you know, a little bit of a speech impediment, and maybe there's a syllable missed. But they do know what these words are. They comprehend them. In many cases, they can approximate them at least. Mm-hmm. And then they have the rich vocabulary, and they they feel good about that, that they're able to, I mean, of course they get a great reaction, but they feel good having the knowledge and being able to sometimes even teach an adult what dinosaur this is or yeah. what and it is the emotional reading. intelligence as well by being very specific about anger frustration yes. guilt you know disappointment there's all different subtleties to all of those words and being able to express which one it is that you're feeling or that your friend's feeling you know so you're yeah by that um, program that you're developing the emotional intelligence is also a big part of it as well so for the people who are listening right now If they really wanted to do like three things that would be extremely helpful and very Montessori-ish with their children coming up in the next week, what would be like three things that would be easy to do that you would say, these are things that like, these are things that you can just put right into motion that would be really easy? Okay, so I think that one of them would definitely be about setting up the home and like mm-hmm. realizing how much stuff you have. So I just put like two boxes by the in your living room and like ones for things they're not really playing with at the moment and others for things that they've outgrown that you might want to store for another child or to donate. And then the rest, you know, simplify what's out. So then you'll actually see, oh, these children can entertain themselves, you know, for longer. And if I see that something's not being played with, then I'll just take and rotate something else in and you'll see, oh my gosh, yes, I forgot we had that. And they're so excited and you'll get much more longevity out of your toys Mm. um then i think it would be something like noticing how many times you step in to solve the problems for them and like how can you support them instead so that one's harder but something that you could definitely already start this week 
And then the last thing could be something like um, setting up their bedroom so that they can, you know, find a place where they would put their washing when they're finished. Mm. Like all little steps in the day that they're always asking you for help with. Oh, okay. How am I going to set this up differently so you can do it for yourself? Mm. Wow. And what a great insight. Up. That's a great yeah. insight to think like, what have they been asking me for help on? And then I can then respond to that and say, how can I have, have them do it by themselves? What do I need mm -hmm. to put into place? And that frees you up to just do fun things with your kids as opposed to nagging them all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I think everybody likes that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So at this point, I would love to get your top tip out of all the things we've talked about or perhaps things that we haven't. What do you want us to come away with uh, with regard to raising a curious and confident and responsible Montessori toddler? So I think the thing that we've probably discussed the most is actually seeing the world through our toddler's eyes or through our child's eyes. So when we take their perspective, we see that they're not trying to give us a hard time or they're not trying to run away or they're not trying to slow us down or they're not trying to snatch that toy of someone else. They just want to play with it right now. And then we'll be able to support them and maybe give them the skills um, if they're lacking them, maybe set a limit if they need it or maybe give them the freedom to try it, get it wrong and learn from it. So mm -hmm. I think perspective taking would be the biggest thing I would like people to take away from our conversation today love it love it give us the resource of the week where can people get more information about you and your book and all the great work you're doing so the easiest place to find me is on my website the montessori notebook.com and from there you can find details about the montessori toddler book um, and uh, links to social media i'm mostly on instagram from there and i hope that people can reach out and i can answer their montessori questions if they have them Really great work. I'm so excited about what you've done. I, the book is beautiful, everyone. It is just an absolutely stunning book with great pictures and examples of, of what to look for and how to set your house up and and even some examples of, of your house, right? <laughs> your house, uh, of how you set things up. I just loved it. So thank you so much for your insights and your strategies. I, I love the idea of looking through your toddler eyes. And again, I would underscore that this is a great uh, idea for any age that we should try to look through our child's eyes, our teenager's eyes, to look from their perspective and think, what are they trying to accomplish? And what is it that they really need? And, and then helping to support that or scaffolding that so that they have the uh, option of being independent. So thank you so much for being on the show today. And thank you for having me. It's been such a beautiful conversation and I love your work in wanting to, you know, rephrase, reframe things and giving people the tools to make those changes. So thanks very much for all your work too. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I've got my takeaways and sweet friends, I know you have yours. So let's discuss them. Come up on Facebook. We can go to the Dr. Robin Silverman page and let's chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com or twitter.com slash drrobin. I'm also on Instagram under Dr. Robin Silverman. And if you love this podcast like I did, what a breath of fresh air. Would you kindly go up to iTunes and rate and review it so other people can learn about these outstanding solutions and use them in their own homes? I truly appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today, my fellow parents, leaders, and educators. Thank you so much for tuning in to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com. So many great podcasts are up there, and the show notes to this podcast will be up there as well. I look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together. And please remember, even on the days when we fall short, we've got this. You're here. You're getting the information you need. I know it's not easy, but never forget there's always tomorrow. Parenting is the ultimate do-over. I see you and I'm right there with you. And as there are moments when we doubt our know-how, our choices, and our sweet sanity, please know that you are 10 times the parent you think you are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connecting through conversation. See you next week. You've been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information,